McNair gives it to George, running right up the middle. Touchdown! It's a miracle! You're safety, now you're one on one with it. Shows why he's the man! In trouble. Sacks! Ladies and gentlemen, Titan Nation, how are we doing today? Today I have a special guest. This young lady is WSMV for Nashville sports anchor, Lauren Walsh. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you? Pretty good. Now, before anything, uh, I, I needed to get this off my chest. And we talked a little bit before, but I didn't bring this up. But I wanted to bring it to your attention now. Um, you have probably, I saw a picture on your Twitter account. And it's, it's, I have to say it's terrible. And what I mean by terrible is you have a picture of the Boston Red Sox. Fenway Park. Yeah, and it is terrible, okay? I, you don't see it here, but above it says murderous row. Yeah. Like, okay, yeah, exa exactly. You already know where I'm coming from, okay? So I'm a diehard Yankees fan. We talked a little bit, and you know I'm from Jersey. And... I was like, you know what, this is, this is this might be a a make or break on on the channel, but uh well, I unknowingly wore my Red Sox hat, of course. Um <laughs> yeah, I don't know if that's going to be a problem with the the Yankee Sox thing, but um uh that's a, a big part of I would say the identity of most native Bostonians including myself. So, yeah. Yeah. maybe we can get past it. Hopefully, I, I think so. I, th I think I, I think I could, you know, give you a, give you a break. I had um, I had my my buddy Ben Trope. Uh, he was a obviously played for the Florida Gators, and I I'm, went to Florida State. So I was like, you know what, I, I'm 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 okay with letting this pass. The the rivalry can can sit out for now while we talk a little bit about sports and stuff like that. But I just wanted to throw that out because I know that I saw that Fenway Park. I was like. Boston but again you're you know born and raised how long have you been a Red Sox fan all your life right yeah yeah um <laughs> I, I look back and sometimes when people ask me about how I got started in sports or even just mm -hmm. fandom in general um I say that the 04 playoffs oh. and World Series were sorry Ooh. uh not sorry though were it was probably the first <laughs> true sports conscious moment mm -hmm. of my life in the sense that I could really understand and remember what I was watching and um, be able to understand the impact as well. Mm -hmm. And of course they reversed the curse and it's the 86 year drought. And, you know, they lost to the Yankees in the ALCS the year prior, which my family ha had watched and all of that. So then when they reversed the curse in 04, and the way they did it coming back from the 3-0 hole in the playoffs, it, if you had asked me, I was about 10 years old, what was the most important thing happening in the entire world? I would have said that, what the Red Sox were doing. So it was really cool. And I, and I think really spurred my fandom, which was at an early stage mm -hmm. into like a borderline obsession with wanting to know the history of teams in Boston and all the players, current and former and like my dad would quiz me when we were out at, you know, a sports bar for lunch and there'd be like pictures of players on the walls. So uh, that World Series and, and title and Sox team, I think were very impactful in the trajectory I ended up going on. Well, that's awesome. I mean, it, it, that series had a really big impact on me too, but vice versa. I I'm think. sure it did. <laughs> it went the sure other way. I, I don't, I still to this day will not, even even if they have highlights, I, I turn it off because that you only have to live through that once. And that's that was rough. That was a rough time. That was a rough time. But I'm glad it was positive on your. Yes, <laughs> it was fulfilling for me. <laughs> <laughs> and right there, you kind of is that where you wanted to start? Like you said, journalism and, and you said like getting into like sports and 
is that what you wanted to do when you were younger or? I, I didn't know anyone who was in media, certainly not television, no one who was a print writer, radio, none of those things. So um, I was playing sports from a young level. And it's funny, my parents had me in a lot of individual sports. I'm not sure why, like skating, swimming, dance, gymnastics. Some of those, there's a team aspect, but ultimately you're competing as an individual, of course. And uh, a friend's dad like saw me ice skating and was like, hey, she's pretty fast. And he ended up recruiting me for all of his team sports, soccer, basketball, and softball, which ended up being like my world okay. and played those into high school and was really obsessed with like just improving my skills and being a good leader. And so I, I got a lot out of my sports journey as a player um and luckily i had a coach in high school who said hey i'm trying to start up a video class my high school did not have one okay and he was my coach so he could kind of swing like an independent study type of thing and said hey why don't you take this camcorder which makes me sound pretty old but like technology <laughs> just developed so fast oh, <laughs> we were still using camcorders and take this camcorder and go shoot the high school football game and ask the coach a question after or something. Mm -hmm. And I was out there, had no idea what I was doing. I had very little instruction, but I give him a lot of credit for just planting the seeds mm -hmm. of that sports reporter, sports broadcaster career, because I had always liked writing. So it paired well that I had an English teacher who said, well, have you thought about journalism? You're a really good writer. So I started putting those things together, doing research. And that was when I came across Syracuse and thought, well, based on everything I'm reading, if I can somehow make this work financially for the most part, then I think I need to go here if I really want to do this job. So I put it together, I think, with the help of some great mentors and influences around me in my young sports career, because I really had no exposure to this as something I could do for a job. Gotcha. Yeah. Nothing, nothing wrong with camcorders. Again, I, I kind of started like that too. And at a young age with camcorders, I mean, I, I remember, I mean, that's, that's what we had. It wasn't our phones or nothing like that. And I had to get, like, I had the camcorder that had the little tape inside that you recorded and then you had to take the tape out yep. and like in the VHS and then like put it in. So it's, it's crazy. Now. Yep. The whole deal. <laughs> So it, it, I think I think back then it was, it was a struggle to it's a it was a whole process compared to now. Now it's pretty. I mean, you ha you have these phones and you can do yeah, of course, anything and edit everything. Now there's no excuse for someone who wants to do media. Yeah. Um, you can buy a a microphone and a adapter for your phone on Amazon and really anything you need. So it, that part of it has been cool to see technology come along. So really anyone can start creating content. Absolutely. What was your first gig? It was. What was um, it? Well, I, I will say my first internship was with the Red Sox. Um, and as a larger sense, like it was with Nesson, New England Sports okay. Network. Um, but there were four on site interns at Fenway Park. And I was one of them. So we got to like be in the truck and be at the ballpark. Uh, so all of that was super cool. It was Big Poppy's final season in 2016. Mm -hmm. Um, so that was like a dream come true for me. That was the first internship. Um, first job, I think kind of fits the storyline of a lot of people in the industry of a first mm -hmm. break or right place, right time kind of thing. So it was actually about three months after I graduated from Syracuse, had been applying for jobs far before then, not getting anything. And I had a professor who was an adjunct professor because he was the sports director at WSYR, the ABC television affiliate in Syracuse. They had someone from their three-person sports team abruptly leave in July. So they're about to start high school football season mm -hmm. within which they do a huge blowout Friday night football highlight show as a lot of stations do. They had a weekly 30-minute Syracuse football show along with covering uh, college and high school football Friday to Saturday. They did high school on Saturdays there too in New York state. So um, I applied for the job and got in touch with him because I had been in his class and 
um, maintained a connection with him. So he said, Hey, we're really looking for someone with more experience than you, but you know, I'll definitely keep you in touch and, and updated in the process. So basically what they said was they were going to hire someone with more experience than me, who was a former classmate of mine, like three years ahead of me. So he had already been in the business in a smaller mm -hmm. market. And they said, but he's tied up through a contract into like October. So if you want to come here for the most unstable position ever and be a part-time temporary employee for three months and you'd be the number three person in the sports team, it could help you develop a professional reel and it would help us maintain our level of coverage throughout football season. So I didn't know where I was going to live or what I was going to do, but I moved right back to Syracuse, New York and figured all that out. So I'm of course, immensely grateful to that station and my former professor and sports director for that opportunity, because then um, I ended up getting a full-time job in Burlington, Vermont. So that's where I was full-time first, but I like to mention the Syracuse thing because people exactly. say this business is about who you know, and, and it really is. And so that was really how I got my foot in the door. Oh, nice. That's crazy though. And now you ended up uh, didn't you end up also in North Carolina for a little bit as well? Yes. Uh, so I was the sports director there, uh, had been a one woman sports department, in fact, in Vermont and North Carolina collectively wow. for uh, about two and a half years. So that was really formative because it was extremely challenging, but it totally yeah, fortified yeah, my skills and Producing, shooting, editing, writing, anchoring, reporting, all of it. <laughs> yeah, um, but it, it was, yeah, it's all brought me to where I am now. So I was in North Carolina for about three to three and a half years and uh, then ended up getting the job in Nashville. So I've been here for about six months now. How do you like Nashville? It's been awesome, honestly. Um, coming from a large city. We, I grew up like 15 minutes north of Boston, so we were really close. And I'm used to a lot of diversity and people and restaurants and activities even. So living in those smaller places, especially Vermont, which was really rural, wasn't always the best fit for me in terms of having the professional and personal balance in your life. Mm -hmm. But I think a lot of people go through that in this job, trying to work your way up to somewhere that you have both of those things and feel fulfilled in both aspects. So I had a, a better balance of that in North Carolina for sure. Um, but here certainly is the best of the bunch so far for me. Um, I love that it's a big city feel. Funny enough, I don't like country music at all, uh, but oh, wow, I've okay. still, yeah, I've still really, really enjoyed the city. The restaurants have made some friends here. I think much to the dismay of the locals at times, there are a lot of transplants. So there's a lot of people my age looking to play in a rec soccer league after work, which I do in my free time or things like that. So I, I feel like I've adjusted really quickly, really well. That's good. What do you, what do you like to listen to? If you don't mind me asking, then if you don't like country. Uh, I listen pretty exclusively to rap and hip hop. Okay. Okay. Any, any, and uh, then any in some Spanish music. Oh, some Spanish music too? Yes. Okay. Okay. Well, you like, like Bad Bunny or something? I mean, that's where everyone Yes. Goes. <laughs> I'm a big Bad Bunny fan. I'm trying to go to his concert here in uh, he's May, a, I think. He's expensive. He's expensive. Yeah, he is. He's a hot ticket right now. Mm -hmm. That's, that's interesting. And what, and what it got you into Hispanic music? Uh, I just, I learned Spanish in school from a young age. And it's funny, my brother and I joke because we had all the same teachers, but for some reason for me, it just stuck. And <laughs> his Spanish is like very minimal. Yeah, I've always liked English and grammar. So I think I was able to really see the translation of like adjacent verb tenses and, and things of that nature. And once I learned the vocab, I didn't really forget it. So I minored in it in college and studied abroad in Spain and was probably fluent at that point. Okay. Now, less so. I, I think I could still say anything I needed to within reason in Spanish, but I don't have a lot of opportunities to practice it. So Bad yeah. Bunny is a main form of practice for me. <laughs> That's good. That's good. Bad yeah. Bunny's not bad yet. Bad Bunny's 
pretty good. Um, so when you got to Nashville, um, where, did you already know that you were going to be covering all the sports? You covered all the sports, correct? The Preds, um, the soccer, the soccer games, the Titans and stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, we discussed it a little bit in the interview, but even before the interview, um, I had already just been doing research to prepare myself. So not only on what the station covers, but everything about those teams, really, especially the professional ones. And then I would say like your large college programs, Balls, Vandy, and so on. Um, luckily in school, I was very nerdy. So the fact that I was interested in sports just made this job and the process of seeking a new job, like yeah. a giant research project, but it just happens to be on a topic that like I really enjoy. So I would make like these really elaborate, either like notebook style documents on Microsoft Word or sometimes like a color coded thing on Google Docs or whatever, where I would go through like different categories, like history, former players, current players, like um, like franchise defining moments and like m basically absorb as much information as I could, which happens for me a lot through writing it so I would just be making all these notes and did that before the interview again so I would be prepared but continued that process as I've been living and working here I think if I don't know the teams that I cover as well as my hometown teams then mm -hmm. how could I reasonably speak to viewers who root for those teams so I, I take that responsibility um, just, you know, with pride and, and seriously, and I may never know the Titans quite as well as maybe I do like my number one favorite team, which probably would be the Celtics. Um, but like, that is the standard that I pursue in my work. That's awesome. And it, and it shows, you know, it shows Thanks. Um, what, um, what was the first Titans game you covered? Then if you could walk, it us, was... could walk me through like that that whole day if you could like just you know not the whole day but like just like tidbits or, or certain things that you remember from your first day okay so it was the titans patriots preseason game if that counts it was yeah, preseason not regular season but it was i count it because and it was the first time i was in nissan and went through a game day process even though it was a night game i think it kicked at seven are you a um fan too i'm assuming Am I what? A Pats fan? Yeah. I, I did grow up a Patriots fan, yes. Okay. So it's kind um, of it's like kind of like it helped you out too as well. Because I, I always Sure, like yeah. And I mean it was like it felt full circle in a sense. The first Titans game I cover, they're playing my hometown team. So that was mm -hmm. a fun little nugget. <laughs> Shout out to my sports director, Chris Harris, for letting me cover that game. Um so yeah, it we arrived probably very very early because I believe we did two live hits it's possible we did three mm -hmm. um, but I know we at least were live in the five o'clock show and then probably the six o'clock show because normally we have sports in the six thirty half hour but that would have been too close to kickoff so it wouldn't have happened on the field um, so I did probably one to two live shots um, and I'm with a photographer for those. So the way that goes down is we've been talking to the Titans nonstop, which is the standard during the season. We usually talk to them five times a week. They're off Tuesdays and usually traveling Saturdays or just no media on Saturday, even if it's a home game. So we have plenty of content and I beforehand would choose what is the most notable storyline that I could present before this game that fans should know about that I you know find interesting myself because if, if I don't care about it like why am yeah, I even exactly. supporting it which of course sometimes might be the case if it's something you don't like but ideally as a sports fan like you can identify importance and interest in a storyline as well um, even as a member of the media so um, I can't remember exactly what that was. We might have been talking about maybe the O line, which was such a consistent storyline that I might yeah, be like, just default. That's, that. Yeah, that's nothing new right now. But, but I think there's a good chance it was about the O line. So I would 
come on camera. They would toss to me from the studio and, oh, it was really, really hot. Even though it was probably five o'clock, it was still summer. So everybody down there was very sweaty, like more so than the players at that point. Like the media, we were probably out there like burning up under the lights before the players really got going. The TV lights get hot. And um, <laughs> not to compare myself to exerting you know, to the equivalent of an NFL player. It's all jokes, but um, <laughs> we, yeah. So I come on camera and, and say a portion on cam and then some video would come up, soundbite from whichever players that support the storyline. And then I would tag out, as we say, toss back to the anchors. So I, I probably had a live hit or two. And then I'm watching the game from the press box. Our photographer shot the game and I'm keeping track of storylines, making notes, tweeting. Um, which is what most of us are doing up in the press box. Yeah. Go downstairs, um, went through like the process of the locker room, which I had covered the Panthers in Carolina. So that wasn't totally new to me, but of course, just slightly different. It, it's a new building, making mm -hmm. sure that, you know, I'm being respectful of whatever uh, preferences Titans PR might have. And when we approach certain players and, and things like that. So uh, it's just, it was just a bit of a learning and observing process since it was my first game, but overall it, it was great. It was a lot of fun. Um, the Titans PR people that we communicate with, um, I think are really helpful, really willing to work with us. So they helped aid that transition as well as my coworkers at channel four. So, um, overall it was a really great first time out at Nissan covering the Titans. Who's uh, your, because Teron would tell me there's certain players that he would go to a little bit more, gravitate towards more, just because he was more comfortable. They might give him, give him a little bit more information. Was there any player that you kind of gravitated to and like talking to the most out of, out of the team? Yeah, I think we all, we even discussed that within the media. We know who the good sound bites are. And it, it just, it's the same as anything that, Sometimes you come across people who are either more introverted or mm -hmm. some who just frankly like to talk or who are very honest when they speak. So um, be, if you've been a reporter really of any kind, print, radio, TV, uh, you just kind of know what a good soundbite is. And that doesn't mean mm -hmm. they say what you want them to say. It means that they, they speak well and usually say something of interest to give insight that only the player can give. So some people are just better at articulating that than others. So for the actual quality of insight, uh, definitely Kevin Byard and probably Jeffrey Simmons were two of the best in that realm. Of course, Byard for, you know, only a percentage of the season. Mm -hmm. But uh, I always like talking to Arden Key because uh, you will never get anything sugar-coated. You might have something that we had to bleep on TV, but I think that you, it's pretty rare in an NFL locker room to have someone who's that unfiltered and honest and a lot of times like injecting humor into his mm -hmm. responses and things like that. So it wasn't always like what we, just a regular run of the mill, like midweek soundbite, but mm -hmm. um it was always interesting. It was always interesting, which is why if I had the opportunity, I would ask to speak to him. I think it was after, I want to say, I'm trying to think, maybe it was like the second to last home game this year. I can't remember. It was one of the ones down the stretch. And of course, playoffs are off the table. They're mm -hmm. losing. And I had actually approached uh, two players and somebody else put this on Twitter even though it happened to only me and one other reporter, the person who tweeted it, it didn't even happen to them, but things like that, you know, go down in NFL markets. So we had asked two players after one of those losses, if they could speak to us and they said no, and had some words about not wanting to speak to us, you know? So um, it, I think in an NFL locker room, you just have to navigate those personalities as best you can and try and be respectful of their time that they're giving you to speak as well as their space. Um, it is their locker room post game as well. So um, it can be a little bit of, you know, a balancing act, but um, I certainly enjoy like the, the very honest and raw players um, when we get the chance to speak to them.
Yeah, well, definitely, because it also has the fans. The fans can connect to with such an honest response. And I know there was a yeah. few of of Key's moments where you had those clips where you're like, I mean, he's right. Like, he would say, like, oh, we just – we played, you know, we played like crap. And like, we didn't do good. We didn't – and and sometimes instead of going around the question or going around the problem, some fans just like to hear that. Like, look, he just owned up to it. Like, they weren't good today. They just – the defense yeah. – was you know stunk so um yeah. yeah so it's it's funny to to hear your side of the story and 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 hear hear that situation now what's your as covering the titans for i think you said uh, for six months now what's your favorite uh i guess moment what's your favorite moment or what uh, excites you the most um with with football is it the post games is it just doing the pre games or is it you know going on the field was it for you that you enjoy the most at your job? Um, well, for me, I would say it's always the feature storytelling. So telling a story that lets people into why a player maybe operates a certain way or a meaningful reason, maybe just to like their why and, and how they do things. Maybe it's like, a family member that impacted them, or uh, they might wear a certain number, you know, in honor of somebody else, or there are, of course, lighter things in that realm, but we usually call them feature stories, as in beyond like X's and O's and and day-to-day game things. So um, I did sit down with Amani Hooker, so we, it was the bye week, so um, the Titans were really great to allow that and facilitate it, and so I talked to him about his career and he really played every like five, six positions in high school and was like breaking records and was exceptionally great in a variety of positions on the field was pretty under recruited in um, Minnesota and was like waiting to get the call from the university of Minnesota and um, didn't. And when Iowa called and recruited him, he was like, okay, I'm there. (laughs) Um, Went to Iowa. They want him to be a DB. Um, and he, 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 the point of the story was he's kind of always felt like he had a chip on his shoulder. And as you as a Titans fan know, I mean, if, if, if you needed a tackle, Amani Hooker was there when he was on the field. And when a play broke down and people were missing tackles, like somehow there he was flying in to, even if the play was still like a chunk play for the other team, at least put an end to it. Yeah. Um, of course, you know, like, there was the the week one, like first play of the season two. Um, like he gets in there to like, basically like for like a, a kind of like a strip tackle on the kickoff. Um, he was just all, all over the field. So I was like, you know, you're making all these plays and do you still feel like you're undervalued or overlooked? And he was like, yeah, I do feel like that sometimes. So, um, and he had a lot of great things to say. So I, I really enjoy those opportunities to get to know a player um, help fans get to know a player better and who they are and and why they do this and, um, maybe what contributed to their success. So that was really great. Um, I think you also asked about like a story or a moment. Um, so I'll share this when the Titans were getting ready to play the Dolphins on Monday night football, Mm -hmm. hard knocks was going on. And they're profiling the Dolphins at, at that time. And I had been watching it and I really enjoy Hard Knocks. So it was near the end of the Vrabel presser. I wouldn't ask this first. Normally, if someone has a lighter or offbeat question, you kind of wait till the end. It's like an unspoken thing. And so I asked Mike Vrabel, hey, I'm curious how much value, if any, you see in Hard Knocks. Is it more cinematic for you or is there any type of like game prep value so, yeah. if, if you watch or whatever and uh of course he like chose to be cheeky in that moment and said well probably like stumbled for it like mumbling doing the Vrabel thing it was like well do you, I don't know do you, what do you think of it and I was like what? so I, I was like uh I mean I think it's a bit more cinematic, but I wanted to know from your perspective. And he's like, well, there you have it. Then it's cinematic. <laughs> and it was, I just thought it was a funny exchange. Um, Vrabel 
of course, like had some viral things where he could be harsh in press conferences, but mm -hmm. um, some of those lighter moments I thought flew under the radar. So I was asking truly because as many of us have not played or coached NFL football, yeah. I was curious if there is any type of insight that he could get, even a small nugget from, from watching the buildup to their week of facing the Dolphins. Because it's even for me question. as a media member, I, I get a lot out of watching it. Um, mm -hmm. As someone who covers football, enjoys football, loves storytelling in sports. So I, I wanted to know from his perspective what, what level of value he sees in it. So I thought it was a fair question. Um, he chose to take a, a comedic route, but I, I mean, I, I still could appreciate the interaction. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of Mike Rabel, like kind of playing with the media and, and kind of brushing off a, a good question, which, I mean, I think it's a valid point. I, th I think you had where your head was at. I, th I think it was. A, yeah, I thought so too. So it, that's how he chose to answer it. So that's okay. <laughs> that sucks. It's like, brr, brr, like, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but. That's interesting. That's interesting. Especially those press press conferences could be, especially towards the end of of uh, his head coaching here. It was very interesting. It was, yeah. It was. Um, I I think you'll enjoy this, especially with the Patriots tie. So I never got to tell Vrabel this story because, of course, we just get him in this formal dose in the sense that he is at a podium we're in chairs. It's not like we're just up shaking hands with him all the time. Some days. Yes, we were a little closer cameras, but point is, he, you know, he's always on the go, understandably. So I wanted to tell him if I got the chance that I went to a Patriots training camp as a kid mm -hmm. and it was with my summer camp. That was the only reason I got to go. They had like passes. We were at a boys and girls club camp and we went there and I had a football that my dad probably gave me some random football to get signatures if I could. And I came back and now I live with my mom. So I was like, mom, like I got the football sign and she's like, cool. Okay. She just wasn't that into sports. So I was like, great, honey. And um, then whenever I saw my dad and showed him, he was like, who signed this? And I was like, uh, cause I was, I was young. So it wasn't, it wasn't Tom Brady. So like, I didn't know who the other guys were. I could have been like six, seven. <laughs> so to retain like, you know, supporting yeah. players names, it wasn't really in the cards for me yet. And um, I believe he, like the players were putting their numbers, which mm -hmm. was the key um, because uh, it turned out that Rabel, among a few other players that we were able to decipher had signed the football. Interesting. So I, I wanted to tell him like, Hey, you know, when I was a kid, actually you signed a football for me at Patriots training camp, never got the chance though. So that was unfortunate. Dang. That should have been. Maybe like, one day I'll cross paths with him. But that's and, that's and get cool though. That. Look look how like that yeah. comes full circle and stuff. Like that's yeah, more yep. <laughs> interesting. That's wild. That's actually a pretty good story. Yeah, now, yeah. Do you, do you have the football. I don't know if you have the football. I have a. I a, know that's what people at my station asked me too, and I was like, honestly, my mom is like a low level hoarder, but like a <laughs> more like sentimental keepsake yeah. person tag on her. She keeps everything. So I would imagine it's somewhere like in our basement, which would not be easy to find, but it there's a chance it's down there with her. <laughs> yeah, I went to training camp and I got Ryan Tannehill to sign this, but the problem with this football is that I actually had a silver Sharpie because obviously it would pop better with the silver Sharpie and he wasn't paying attention. And I'm like, I had the silver Sharpie. I'm like, hey, man, you can use this. And he was like looking away and he was just like, I'm like, hey man, uh, you, you can use a silver Sharpie. And he just like, and I was like, I guess so. So that's uh, you take what you can get, but exactly. One, one, of our, one of our there. friends, it's it's a funny story because he was talking to her while he was signing this ball. So every time she's okay. like, oh, did uh, Ryan Tannehill have that silver sharpie? I'm like, don't even. So I'll send her a picture <laughs> just like this. I'll be like, damn football. Like, but it's funny though. It was, it was, it's a funny story just to have. It is. Yeah, yeah. you just. Dude, completely like was ignoring me i was like hey man i was just like and i had like you want to switch out the shirt <laughs> or just like like yeah, yeah i was like no wait no. i'm like whatever it's happening i know i think they just get in it you know like an yeah, automated yeah. mode yeah. to signing yeah. going down the line at camp it's nice of them to do that but yeah definitely. I, i'm not <laughs> <laughs> but um well lauren i i want to take much more of your time i do appreciate you coming on and talking about your career um you've done a great job and obviously people in Nashville love you hey. and we'll continue. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Even though 
you are a Patriots fan, and it was it was a little rough in the beginning of this podcast. Just but I had to I had to I had to bring that out. I actually have a New York Yankees flag over here to the right, but um, you talk about hoarder. Like my my garage is is a hot mess right now, and I I'm showing you well, <laughs> young children these days wouldn't know the Yankees are a playoff caliber team. So, I mean, they've got to, they've got to do some work to get back there. Yeah. We'll, we'll eventually we'll get there. I mean, it, it happens, but you know, 27 is, is a nice number of championships, you know, <laughs> <laughs> how I'll, many I'll, of this century? Oh, okay. You know, we're not going to get in this debate right now, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to say, thank you. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah, this was great. Thanks for having me, Alex.